Welcome to my study. After 30 years, I've concluded that everything you need to know to be successful in every part of your life is found in one book, the Bible. While our subject has been how to develop moral intelligence, nothing could be more important than having moral intelligence. It affects every area of life. It affects business, affects relationships, affects marriage. And uh, so our subject today is kind of unusual because I want to point to how moral intelligence relates to, are you ready, the holiness of God. And so I want you to catch this right off the bat in your notes. Um, <clears throat> moral intelligence is the essence of holiness. You know, we, we, we talk about God and we talk about him being holy and we sing songs in our churches like, Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. But I'm not sure that we grasp what we mean when we say God is holy. As if he's somewhere off removed in the universe and in a character zone that doesn't really relate to us. So I want to help us get definition of it properly as our first point is simply this, that moral intelligence is the essence of holiness. When we say something is somebody is holy, it means they have moral intelligence. They do what is right, not what is wrong. So let's take a look at a couple of scripture. Who is like unto the Lord? Who is like unto thee, O Lord? My goodness. Among the gods, and those a small g because there's a lot of people make up gods that are really no gods at all, right? But who is like unto thee? Who is like unto thee, glorious, now watch this, glorious in holiness, Ooh. fearful in praises, doing wonders. Now, don't miss this. Um, in fact, uh, let me go here first, glorious in holiness, and then let's go to a definition here of what it means to be holy. <clears throat> and this is basically out of the Oxford English Dictionary, and holy means to be free from all contaminations of sin or of evil. Free of all contaminations of sin or evil. In fact, it means to be morally and spiritually perfect and unsullied. Um, no mixture in with holy and unholy, unsullied. Possessing the infinite and perfection and the moral perfection, moral perfection that is normally attributed to God. So we understand then that God is holy, um, and, and we must never forget that, that God is holy, and that his holiness consists in the fact that he is the ultimate in moral intelligence, and that's what we're going to discover. But let's look at some more scriptures. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Everybody should know that. And look at this now. The knowledge of the holy, the knowledge of the holy is understanding. How much do you know or understand about holiness? Or let me ask you this way. How much do you know or understand about moral intelligence? For understanding, the, or the, or the knowledge of, of moral intelligence gives you understanding. In fact, let's go to the word understanding for a moment. It means the ability, <clears throat> excuse me, to accurately comprehend and uh, to comprehend the, the reason and the logic behind any given action. It is the ability to accurately comprehend the logic and the reasoning behind whatever is, uh, in fact, going, going on. <clears throat> um, it means to um, grasp the facts and know why they are the way they are. And that is what we mean by understanding. Now, of all the beings in the entire universe that 
could possibly know everything there is to know about moral intelligence, the answer has got to be God. He understands. In fact, let's take a look at a couple of scriptures. Look at this. This is an amazing thing, understanding this about God. He telleth the number of stars. I should have put a picture in here of the galaxies of the universe. Look at this. He tells the number of the stars. And he calls them all by their names. Can you imagine the mind of this person called God? Great is the Lord. You have to say that, right? Great is the Lord of great power. And his understanding is infinite. Like, I mean, there is no end to it. He knows it all. Maybe that's what we mean by omniscient. He knows everything that's knowable. Now, the, the prophet Isaiah comes now, and he asks this question to you and to me. He says, have thou not known? Don't you know this? Have you not heard? Have you not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, right? The creator of the ends of the earth, faints not. Watch this now. He's not weary. Now watch this. And there is no searching of his understanding. That doesn't mean you can't find it out. It means there's so much there you could never find it, all of it out. It's so infinite in dimension. So our first thing is to understand that moral intelligence is the essence of what it means to be holy. And based on the scriptures that we've just looked at, you should comprehend with me this simple fact that only God knows what is holy. If, you're, if you want to know what is morally intelligent, He's the only source to go to. He's the only one you can find it out from, right? Let's look at the scripture. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. And now this predicts something that's eventually going to happen, because everybody eventually is going to figure it out. Watch this. And all nations, when they figure it out, shall come and worship before thee for thy judgments, thy adjudications about every facet are made manifest. When, when entire nations see the glory of God, the holiness of God, the smartness, the wisdom, the judgments, the adjudications of God, they... They will come and worship before thee. But here's what I want you to pick out of this verse. There is nobody. Don't let anybody tell you what is morally right unless they agree with God. Never. Remember, remember with me the scripture we've referred to it numbers of times. Woe unto him that calls, puts good for evil and evil for good. It calls right wrong and wrong right. And let me tell you, my friends, there's a lot of that going on these days. And these people sound convincing. Um, probably the most dangerous person on earth is the liar who believes his lies. Because he carries with the lie an ambiance of certainty that can be persuasive. So one must understand this, that, that only God is holiness. Now, I want you to move with me. Remember this, that intelligence is what we call holiness, and holiness is, in, is moral intelligence. And, and in fact, that only God, only God really knows what is holy. Now, I want you to move with me in a progression here. And I want you to catch this. For God's 
holiness, or in other words, his moral intelligence, is the primary cause for the praise, worship, and adoration of him. Why would we worship God if he were angry and bitter and judgmental and um, sinful and uh, conniving and manipulative? And, ah, it wouldn't. It is his holiness or his moral intelligence that compels us. It is the primary cause for the praise and worship and the adoration of him. Let me show you a couple of verses about that. Exalt ye the Lord our God, and worship at his foot. So look at this. For he is holy. That's the reason. Now watch. Let me go back in this verse. Exalt the Lord. That has to do with giving praise to God, right? And worship at his footstool. Oh, oh God. Why? The reason behind the worship is right here. Look at this. Because, because he is holy. Because he has moral and intelligence and that's why we worship him that's why he is worthy of worship the lord is righteous he always does what's right in all his ways and holy in all his works oh bless the lord O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name <laughs> Sounds sounds like a verse you ought to say right after you finish your noon meal or your supper deal. <laughs> All that is with it, be blessed is holy. <laughs> but that's not the essence of this. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is with all my heart, my mind, my soul. Bless. Look at this now. Why would we do that? Because we're blessing his holy name. His, his name that represents his moral intelligence. In the Old Testament, they they were commanded to do this. Watch that. Thou shalt make a plate of pure gold, okay? Grave upon it like the engravings of a signet. And it should say, holiness to the Lord. They had to wear it on their clothes. As a reminder, every priest, the holiness unto the Lord, holiness unto the Lord. And it ought to be, and it ought to be the constant reminder for each of us that some way. Now we use different uh, pieces of jewelry and religious jewelry, and sometimes it's a cross, and that certainly reminds me of a holy God. Everything, every aspect of God is holy. Entirely conform to moral intelligence. Okay. So watch the scripture. Exalt the Lord. Worship at his holy hill. For the Lord our God is holy. Now watch this. For, this is the reason why you would exalt the Lord, because, and why you would worship, because he is holy. Even our music and our singing, sing unto the Lord. Why should we do that, O ye saints of his? Give, give give thanks. Aren't you glad he is the way he is? Aren't you glad God is a moral being, a holy being in charge? Can you imagine what the universe would be like if the person in charge was not holy and had no moral intelligence? My God. Look at this now. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints. Give thanks. Now, watch this. This is what makes us sing. It is the remembrance of his holiness. Whoa. Wow. Thy testimonies are very sure. Look at this. Holiness becometh thine house. And so we have learned, and properly so, to determine that a church building is really a holy place. Of all the places that ought to be um, holy, it ought to be church. Of all the pla of all the places that should be safe, 
in the whole world. It ought to be a church, a sanctuary. Huh? Okay. So here we have this wonderful reason to worship God because he has moral intelligence. Now, the next step that I want you to get is simply this, that anybody who genuinely worships him must value that holiness, that moral intelligence of God. So let's go to this. Let's, uh, let's go to this point. Genuine worshipers must value personal holiness, or oh, how would you ever worship him? Because holiness is the only reason that compels us to say, oh, holy God, how great thou art. That he would be grant unto us that we being delivered out of the hand of our enemies. Now, isn't that good? Well, let's stop there for a moment. We being delivered out of the hand of our enemies. Let me take a moment here to talk about that. When you're in captivity by the enemy, when he has brainwashed us, we can't see God in all of his greatness and all of his holiness and all of his purity because the first thing we need is to get delivered. We need to get delivered out of the hand of our enemies. Whoa, watch again now. Watch it right now. So that we might serve him without, without fear. Isn't that good? Now watch. In holiness, serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. So before we pass on, I don't want you to miss the essence of this scripture. Look at this. That we should serve him without fear. First of all, in holiness with with moral intelligence. This is not a mindless activity. When we have moral intelligence, that is that is how we can worship him without fear. We do it in holiness. Look at this. And in righteousness, always doing what is right. And look at this. We live our lives before him. Oh, never forget this, my friends. This scripture, <clears throat> thou God seest me. Never forget that we live observed by God. People change their behavior when they see a video camera. <laughs> it's a good uh, preventative of crime, right? Or when somebody's looking, our behavior changes. But watch this now, because we are to serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness, and we are, watch this now, we are before him. Thou, God, seest me. And it's a fact. It's a strange thing to me to think that when the sun goes down at night, the crime rate goes up. Perhaps it's because they think the cover of darkness will conceal bad activities. I'm not sure. What I do know is this, is that God sees in the dark just as well as he sees in the light. In fact, the scripture says, the darkness and the light are both alike unto thee. The night shines just like the noonday. This is a really important. God's watching. Records are being made in heaven. That's why one day when we stand before him, we'll have to give an account for every, every idle word. We're being watched by God, and that ought to jerk the slack out of us and make sure that we indeed um, walk before him in holiness and righteousness. Now watch this. Um, 
and let's go to the next next emphasis here. And we must do this all the days of our life. In other words, it's not good enough to be holy for a moment and not the next moment. It's not enough to do right once in a while. It must be the continuum of our life. We must stay in moral intelligence all the days of our life. So let's go back and take a look at a couple more scriptures about this. Glory and honor are in his presence. Strength and gladness are in his place. So give unto the Lord the glory due to his name. How do you do that? Bring an offering. That'll work. Come before him. Worship the Lord. Now watch this. In the beauty of holiness. Emphasis here. Worship the Lord in the beauty of of holiness. One translation puts it this way, and I think wisely so. Worship the Lord in the beauty of a holy life. And so, genuine worshipers must value. Now, I'm really going to get into something that just, you just can't miss this. Here is my point. God's holiness, that is, his moral intelligence, is the basis of his right, his rightful demand for obedience to him. In other words, he's not asking you to do wrong. He's asking you to do right. And that is the basis of a right, intelligent, morally intelligent, holy God asking all of his creation to be like him, to obey his instruction. Why? Because every instruction that comes from him has moral intelligence embedded in it. In a week or two, we're going to see exactly a whole list of those things. Now, the, the question that every philosopher every thinking person, and certainly every theologian must answer, is what gives God the right to rule? Is it because he's all-powerful? Does that give someone the right to rule because they have more power? Really? I don't think so. If the devil were God and had all power. Does that give him the right to rule you? Absolutely not. We'd have to resist him. The right to rule mankind by God is not found in his power. It's not even found in how smart he is, omniscience. His right to rule us is founded in his moral intelligence. That's who has the right to rule. Before we leave this point, <clears throat> if you're going to vote, and you should, why? Who should you put in governmental authority? What gives them the right to rule? Who should be a congressman, a senator, or a president for that matter? Who should be on the Supreme Court or any court? The answer to that must be those that are morally intelligent because if they lack moral intelligence, holiness, then they're going to rule fearfully. They will destroy. Why? Because they lack moral intelligence. It is the moral intelligence or the holiness of God that gives him the right to ask us and, yea, demand us to obey him. Now, I want to take you to heaven in the scriptures for just a moment. 
thousands and thousands are gathered in the scene that we're about to view. And they're singing. Watch. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. How would they do that? Why in heaven would they be singing the song that Moses sang? And you're going to get the words of that song in just a moment. Why would they do that? They have moral intelligence. And when they look at Moses, Moses understood the moral intelligence behind each of the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. He got it. That's smart. That's morally intelligent. Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's smart. That's morally intelligent. Thou shalt not covet. Want what everybody else has. Thou shalt not kill. So Moses had such moral comprehension, understanding of the moral intelligence of the Ten Commandments. Isn't that tragic today? That's decades ago. A Supreme Court banned, if you can imagine, they banned the presentation of moral intelligence via the Ten Commandments in the classrooms of the college and the colleges and the high schools and the grade schools and the kindergarten schools of this country. Banned moral intelligence intelligence being taught. Let's get back to heaven. So they sing the song of Moses. Because when Moses understood the intelligence, the moral intelligence behind the commandments, it made him sing. And so in heaven, they, uh, they got it. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. Now watch this. Now watch. Because it isn't just the song of Moses. Look at this. It's the song of the Lamb. Oh, who's that? Well, if you ask John, he'll make it really plain. He said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. They're singing a song that Moses sang. And they're singing the song that comes from Jesus Christ, the Lamb. Wow. Because he came to show us with precision what was morally intelligent. So let's go back here now. They sing the song of Moses. Uh, the Sermon of God and the Song of the Lamb. Now here's what they're singing. Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God, El Shaddai, Lord God Almighty, right? Look at what they're singing. Just, just, justice, just and true are thy ways. Thou King of Saints. Look at this now. Get the rest of the words. Who shall not fear thee and, O oh Lord, and glorify thy name? How can we stop the worship and the glorifying of God? I think we should sing the song of Moses and the, serv the servant, of, the servant of, man, of God and the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? Now watch this. Here's the reason for the song. Of all the other adjectives, they all culminate on this one point. For thou only Art whole. You're the only one who really understands what moral intelligence is all about. Only thou art holy. Oh my goodness. 
And all nations, we mentioned this before, shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And once people become aware of the judgments of God, they will not help but be able to lift their hands and say, Oh, how great thou art, O God. Now, you can experience that today. You can know the judgments of God and know about what he says is holy and morally intelligent, and you will become a worshiper and you won't have any option. In the meantime, that's what they're singing in heaven, but what's going on on earth? And so here it is. My next point, and you really need to get this, is that the war of all the ages is a war between right and wrong, good and evil. It's a war. It's a cosmic war. Watch this. There was a war in heaven. That's where the war started. It's a, it started a cosmic war, Lucifer. Got kicked out of heaven because of the war. He was perfect in all his ways until iniquity was found in him. He wanted to change the rules. He wanted to decide what was morally intelligent and what was not. And so he said, I will exalt my throne above the throne of God, my stars above the stars of God. I, I, I will be lifted up. Ah, I will decide what's right and wrong. And that's where the war started. And one third of the angels of heaven sided with him. And as you're going to see in a moment, that demands ostracization. It demands isolation. And so he was cast out and no longer has access to the heavens. So the war of the ages is between right and wrong. So now the devil has come down to you, to you. And he's got great wrath. I mean, he's really angry right now because he lost his status. By the way, his status, one third. He was, he was one of the top three angels in heaven. Lucifer and Michael and Gabriel. And now he got cast down. And he's so aggravated, he wants to carry out this war here. And he wants you to be unintelligent morally. That's why they call him the tempter. He's a liar. He does everything he can to get you away from moral intelligence because to get you away from moral intelligence is to get you away from God. Now watch this. Comes the scripture that you probably know so well. For we wrestle not. Our war, what's going on right now, is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities. It's against powers. It's against the rulers of the darkness of this world. It's against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, my friends, I come to you caring as much as I can for you and about you. But here's what you must know. Life is a War. You are living in a war zone. Not only is life a war, but life is your war. God and Satan compete daily to control you, to affect you, to guide you in each of their opposite directions. So life is a war, and life is your war. And that's why the scriptures tell you to do this. This, this is how you know it's your war. Look, at, be sober about this. Be vigilant, because your, your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion, seeking who, who can I get to lose moral intelligence? How can I get people to be unholy? 
How, how can I get them to sin? How, uh, sin, sin. The word with a hiss of a serpent in it, sin. So comes God via the scriptures to say, this is what you should do. Resist him steadfast in the faith. And know that the same conflict that you are having in this war zone, everybody else is going through it too. It's accomplished in the brethren of the world. Everybody is going through this. Life is a war. Life is your war. The war is a hand-to-hand -hand combat. That's why that scripture says we wrestle. We're dealing with it every moment of every day. It's that close all the time. The war is a hand-to-hand -hand combat. Now, here's what I really want you to catch. This battle is the same battle the Lord has against the devil. But the battle belongs to the Lord. Now, there was a time when the Philistines were coming against the Israelites in mass, right? And it didn't look good for them. But here's the word. The Lord doesn't save with a sword or a spear. Watch it now. But look at this. The battle is the Lord's. And he will give you Philistines into our hands. And so this is what I want you to get. You will never have to fight alone. Watch now. Behold, Jesus says, I'm giving you power over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Life is a war. Life is your war. The war is close in, hand-to-hand -hand combat. But God is there to help you. And he's giving you the power. And that's why Scripture says you are of God, little children. You don't have to be a big muscle man. You are of God, little children, and you have overcome them. Now, here's why. Because greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. You have God. When you've got God, you've got all you need. The war is a war of the ages. It's between right and wrong, moral intelligence and moral insanity, I guess would be a good word. Now, you have to deal with the devil. So we haven't got time to do a lot of this. So I, I want you, though, however, to, to go to um, our website, nothingbutthetruth.org, nothingbutthetruth.org. And just type in Satan, and you'll be able, in the search, you'll come up with this video called The Present Status of Satan. And the contents on this 28-minute teach, teaching will really uh, enable you to fight fiercely um, in this war and not be afraid of the devil. He should be afraid of you. All right, let's move on now. We're getting toward the conclusion, but you have to know this next issue. Here it is. Those who are committed to do wrong will always oppose those who are morally intelligent. It's the nature of the war. You're on one side or the other, right? And people who are on the side of evil approving of sin, etc., right? They will all be, be opposed to you if you have moral intelligence because they are the opponent. They are devil-sided, if you please, right? So how do we, what are we going to do about this? Do you doubt in our present culture That, that even government officials and judicial, quote, experts are, are coming against, they're going to tell you that if you stand up for morally right, 
they will call it hate speech. Yeah. So, so I don't want you to leave this teaching without getting the instruction from the Lord on how to deal with it. So here's what the Lord says, how to handle this. Ready? He said, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Whoa. Be ye therefore wise as serpents, harmless as doves. Now, here's what I want you to catch. Because those who are evil are going to, isn't, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be simple if they just go do your evil, but they're not happy to do evil. They want your approval of their evil. They want you to buy into the evil. In fact, they want you to participate in it, and that's where the contention comes. So how are we going to deal with this? So Jesus comes along and he says, I'm going to send you forth like you're like a sheep and, you, and, and they're like the wolves. Seems like an unfair disadvantage, doesn't it? So here's what he says to do. Number one, be wise as serpents. Wow, oh, wish we had time. Maybe you should check out the whole wisdom series on our website. And look at this. I want you to be harmless as doves. Don't let them reduce you into doing back to them what they do to you. And this is the essence of some parts of moral intelligence. Let me give you a few straight phrases right from the words of Jesus when he said, uh, bless those that curse you. Ooh, that's an unusual strategy, wouldn't you say? Do good to those that do evil to you. Oh, my goodness. That's not a common response. Normal reaction. He comes along and he says, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. And that's why we go to this whole idea of his. He says, I want you to go forth like wise as a serpent, but I want you to be harmless as a dove. Stay morally intelligent. Watch now. But beware of men. Um, don't miss this. Beware of men. Watch out. Be alert. That's all it's saying. Okay? Be wise as serpents, harmless as a dove, Watch out for the men. Um, but let's just back up and see. For, for here's what they're going to do. They will deliver you up to the board of your company. In fact, um, they, won't, they will scourge you in their churches. I mean, they're going to... And isn't that the tragedy of our day is that we have so many churches that don't have moral intelligence anymore. They're, in fact, they're called Christian, but ah, need to be questioned. Beware of men. And they're not just going to bring you up between the up on the board in your corporation. Watch this. And ye shall be brought before governors, political leaders, and kings. Uh, courts. And you, you, you're going to be called for my sake. Now watch this. But when they deliver you up, this is stunning. This is wisdom. This is moral intelligent instruction. When they deliver you up, don't premeditate what you're going to say. Don't try and outfox them. Take, look at this. Take no thought how or what you shall speak. <laughs> now why? Watch this now. For it shall be given you in that selfsame hour what to speak. <laughs> this is so good. Remember, moments ago, we talked about you're not in the battle alone, but the Lord is with you. And now they're going to drag you up before councils and governors and courts and even in the church they're going to try and kick you out don't 
try to figure out what to say. Remember that thing? Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Because now it's going to be given you in the self-same hour what you should say. Ooh. Now watch this. Because when it's given to you at that moment, it shall not be you that speak, but it shall be the Spirit of the Father, of your Father, which speaketh in you. Oh my goodness, is this ever delightful? Don't have any fear about this. I know, you're like sheep among wolves, but mm, be wise as serpents, be harmless as a dove, beware of the people. And they're going to call you up. And when they do, and when they call you up, don't bother trying to figure out what to say. It's going to, I'm going to help you right there in that. I can, I can tell you, I don't know how many illustrations of my own life where, well, for example, I was in the hot seat at McGill University in Montreal and, and what's called the pit, the, they had a, they called the bull pit. And there's a speaker and then all the bleachers are around like this and professors and college teachers and, and students are all around you. And after you speak for 10 minutes or whatever the allotted time was, they get to ask you any question. And I learned that day. Because I got questions like, um, if God's a God of love, why is there a hell? If God's a God of love and there is a God of, and there is a hell, why doesn't he force everybody to become Christians? I got questions that were, yeah. But you know what? In that self same hour, the Lord gave me answers. Let's go on with the scripture now. Because the battle gets close, it gets involved in family. A brother who's not morally intelligent and wants to do what's wrong will deliver up the brother even to the destruction of him. And not only that, but the father, the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Why? Because those who want to do wrong will always oppose those who want to do right. And you'll be hated. Of all men, for my sake, my name's sake, but he that endures to the end shall be saved. You know, if somebody's going to hate me, I want to, I want them to hate me for a good reason. Right? I want them to hate me because I'm, not because I'm wrong, but because I'm right. Not because I'm evil, but because I'm good. Not because I agree with their errors, but because I tell the truth. It's going to happen. And, 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 it's already happening now in our culture. You're going to become the enemy. So how do you process this? So let's take a look at scripture here. The disciple is not above his master, nor the servant above his Lord. We aren't any better than Jesus, right? I love this scripture. It is enough for the disciple that he be as his master. He, whoa. You, it just be like Jesus, that's all, right? It's enough. It's enough. You don't have to do anything else in life. Just be like him. That's it. Now watch this. It's enough for the disciple to be as his master and the servant as his Lord. Now watch what Jesus says. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more shall they call them of the household? If they called Jesus the devil, and they did. Jesus, can you imagine? Jesus, pure, son of God, holy. Treated everybody lovingly. And they called him the devil. And that's what they'll do. They will call good evil. And if they did that to him, if they called him the devil, what more shall they do to you? How much more shall they do to you? Oh. Mm. So here's some more instruction. If 
fear them not, therefore. Now watch this. For there is nothing hidden or covered that shall not be revealed. The truth will come out. You know, if I could deliver one sentence to most congressmen, senators, etc., it would be this. Be sure your sin will find you out. Don't be deceived. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Big trouble. Big trouble. So let's go back here and uh, see this one more time. Fear them not, therefore. For nothing is covered that shall not be revealed, and hid that shall not be known. So what I tell you in the secret place, Jesus is saying, I want you to tell it publicly. And what you hear in the ear, preach upon the rooftops. Just get on with living the truth and doing what you should do. <clears throat> I know what I'm talking about here because just recently a distributor of our book turned us down because he objected for three reasons. The first objection was that if there's something in the book that says that a you can only be a that you have to be a Christian to go to heaven then we will not publish your book. In fact, they went on to say that if in your book you say something like love between two people of the same gender is is immoral, we will not publish your book. And uh, if you say that women should not have the free will to make all medical decisions about their bodies, i.e. abortion, then we will not publish your book. So I know a little bit of the persecution that's coming. Not a lot, because we can always get another publisher, and we did. And you'll be receiving some of the fruit of that shortly. So let's cover this now. Sin is the defining of a lack of moral intelligence. Everything that's named as a sin is simply a demonstration, a categorization of something that lacks moral intelligence. So let's take a look at some of them. Now the works of the flesh are these. And so it gives us a list. Adultery. Anybody got that figured out? Isn't it strange how the laws have now come to accommodate adultery? Fornication, the word from which we get porneo, Pornography, Greek word. Uncleanness, talking about moral uncleanness. Lasciviousness, which is uh, sensuality or wantonness. Okay. Idolatry, if you remember the scriptures, it's I, I, covetousness, which is idolatry. You want something so bad, yeah, it becomes an idol, takes over. Witchcraft, <clears throat> hatred, variance, what is that? Some people just have to argue about everything. That's what variance is, argumentative. It doesn't even have to be right or wrong. You just want to argue all the time. Emulations, giving off um, bad reports about others. Wrath, acts done in retaliation. Strife. (sighs) Sedition, what is that? It's sowing discontent about people that are in authority. Sowing discontent about people in authority. Sedition. It's going on in mass right now. Heresies. Of course, you know about that. Envyings. Jealousy over what another person has. Murders. Drunkenness. Revelings, which is uh, like wild partying over festivity things. Going in crazy things. And such like. And it just goes, I mean, there's just, now watch this now, because I don't want you to miss the point, is that sinful is simply a defining of something that lacks moral intelligence. Mm. All of these which I have told you before, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Not going to happen. Now, 
Uh, two more points I want you to catch. And this one is about iniquity. Which, you know, so we've listed some of the sins, right? Uh, which are, with which every sin is a definition in some way or another of a lack of moral intelligence. Mm. But behind sin, what causes all this stuff to go? Why, why do we want to sin? And the answer is a word in the Bible very few people know much about. It's called iniquity. Uh, I guess a contemporary word might be narcissism, but let's take a look at the scripture. Iniquity is the primary cause of all sins. If I sin, thou markest me, and thou shalt not acquit me from mine iniquity. So behind his sin was iniquity. Iniquity is the primary cause of all sins. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. Two different things. I said, I will confess my transgressions, that's my sins unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the, now watch this, the iniquity of my sin. I want you to see that. The iniquity, I want you to see this now, the iniquity of my sin. The iniquity of my, the, the, the cause. So we don't want to just get rid of the sins, we want to get rid of this cause. And so I want to recommend that you, go to our website and type in the word iniquity in the search nothingbutthetruth.org is our website nothingbutthetruth.org and um, there's audios there as well as videos but the audio is this one called the 20 characteristics of iniquity and the word iniquity is used uh, mm, way over 365 times in the bible one for every day of the year strange it's one of the four reasons Jesus went to the cross. He was wounded for our transgressions, but he was bruised for our iniquities, right? It's what turned Lucifer ultimately into a sinner because of him it was said, thou was perfect in all thy ways until iniquity was found in you. <clears throat> so what happens now? We must understand the necessity of all men being redeemed from sin and iniquity and be established in holiness, to be established in moral intelligence. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto moral intelligence, holiness. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see God. Follow holiness, follow moral intelligence. Now watch this. Follow moral intelligence without which no man can see the Lord. My, my, my. And look diligently, lest any of you fail to respond to the power that God gives you to go the right way, the grace of God. Because if we do, we can very easily spring up on him a root of bitterness. And it will cause you trouble. And it will defile many other people. And in fact, it goes on to say, it'll end up in fornication. So we must be redeemed from iniquity and sin and established in moral intelligence. So here's the good news. God be thanked that ye were, past tense, the servants of sin, but you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. And you were made, look at this, this is a made free from sin. Can you imagine? And when you're made free from sin, now you become the servants of doing what's right. You convert from wrong to right. And the same way in which you used to yield your members of your body, as servants to do unclean things, and you used your hands and your lips and your everything else to do iniquity unto other iniquities, even now, yield all the members of your body as servants to do what's right unto moral intelligence, unto holiness. For ye were the servants of sin, 
ye were, but now ye are free. You, you were free, rather. You were the servants of sin, and you were free. You didn't do what was morally intelligent. What fruit had you then? Big deal. The end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin and become the servants of God, you have your fruit unto moral intelligence and the end everlasting life. You have fruit. For the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I said two more, but there's four. <laughs> Number 11, to refuse the redemption, to, be, to refuse to be redeemed from moral insanity is the basis for needful termination and confinement, place of restriction. So watch this now. As the whirlwind passes, that, that's what's got the wicked. They can't survive. They're not going to last. But the righteous is an everlasting foundation. The righteous, the morally intelligent, are going to get everlasting foundation. Now, I want you to see how terrible this is. A much sore punishment. Suppose ye shall be thought worthy. Now watch this. Who have trodden under foot the Son of God. So Jesus came to show us the way, to take our place on the cross, to die for our sins, to be resurrected so we could come into our lives. And we just discount it? Instead, we use his name as a cuss word, a curse word. And we trod underfoot the Son of God. We crucify him afresh, if you please. We have trod him underfoot. And, he, and actually, it gets worse than that. And hath counted the blood the blood of his countenance, wherewith he was sanctified, we consider his blood an unholy thing and have done despite unto the spirit of grace. For he says, Vengeance belongs to me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And the Lord shall judge his people. There must be termination and confinement of those who reject the solution to moral insanity. Refuse redemption. Refuse Jesus. Refuse his blood. Mock. Make fun. Ridicule. Discount. Ignore the Son of God. And that verse ends with this statement. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, here is my last point. And this is really good news. Those that are redeemed to moral intelligence shall inherit eternity. Whoa. Live forever. And highway shall there be, and a way. And it shall be called the way of, oh, oh, it's the way of holiness. It's the way of moral intelligence. The unclean shall not pass over it. But it shall be the, for those, watch this now, the wayfaring man, though, though fools don't have to make any mistake. This is not complicated. This is very easy. Bringing Jesus into your life is Simple and easy. Make him Lord of the silver. Oh. There'll be no lions there. No ravenous, ravenous beast shall go there. It shall not be found there. But, but watch this. But the redeemed shall walk there. Where? Talking about eternity now. The redeemed shall walk there. 
and the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. Ever, eh, not joy that comes for a few moments and leaves. Everlasting joy shall be upon them. And they shall obtain joy and gladness and all sorrow and sighing shall flee away. So watch with me now. One more scripture after this. Because nothing could be more important to you than to become one of the redeemed. Oh. Where you are right now. God's available to you. And he wants to turn you from darkness to light. From the kingdom of Satan to the power of God. Look at the scripture. And the Lord said unto him, Well done. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Watch it now. You have been faithful over a few things. You got this moral intelligence thing right. And look at what look at what he says. I will make thee ruler over many things. Now watch this. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. The redeemed of the Lord are welcomed into eternity. Welcome for everlasting life. This is just a test zone now. Death brings forth life. Now watch the diagram with me because I want you to see that in eternity what's going to inhabit there is moral intelligence, moral intelligence, moral intelligence. Moral intelligence can be trusted. Moral intelligence throughout the universe because without moral intelligence, The universe would not survive. And that's why God, Mr. Big, creator of all things, it's not just because he's big, not just because he's great, not just because he's all-powerful or omniscient, all-knowing, but because he has moral intelligence. And that's why he invites you to join him to be part of his forever plan. Amen. Amen.